Good evening, everybody. We're very pleased to see your faces tonight. It's wonderful that there are so many. My name is Pat Basket. I'm the current convener of our climate declaration. And I'm pleased that we're having this session this particular evening because um, it fits with the um, launching by the PSA of a campaign that they've called Vote Climate. They want climate issues to be at the forefront of the upcoming um, local body elections. So we've got local people talking and uh, that I think will be inspiring for us. The other thing that I want to say about this particular session is that it reflects the aims of our wonderful founder, Jeanette Fitzsimons, who in setting up our climate declaration, wanted to uh, make give people the confidence to feel that they could make changes at grassroots level that would save the world um, and be effective for climate change. Um, and if to that aim, um, she and we organized um, climate action plan meetings in various communities where people met and we drew up uh, a plan of things that they could do together. And, uh, and Joanna Santa Barbara was one of those who uh, assisted uh, or participated with Jeanette in those actions. And so it's my pleasure now to leave you in the hands of Joanna Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Tēnā koto katoa. And this, this audience, this particular audience, will be working on, on certain convictions um, that form the foundation of, of what I'm about to describe. The conviction that we need massive reduction in material and energy throughputs. Uh, we need a contraction of the human enterprise in land, water, material and energy use. And how do we do that at a grassroots level as well as at a, a systemic uh, level? So I, I also work on the uh, principle that we need all actions at all levels by all possible actors in the shortest possible time. And that of course includes the local level and involving local government and iwi. Uh, let me let me tell you my currently favorite story of action from an unlikely direction, action from all actors. Paloma Rose Garcia is a hairdresser in Sydney, and she learned about climate change and took it seriously. And when clients, as they do when they're getting their hair cut, make remarks about the weather, Paloma Rose would find herself talking to them about climate change. And she found that the vast majority of her, client, of her clients are interested in learning more and that they want to know what they can do. So she wrote out a list of all possible actions uh, that she thought people could do and gave it to her clients. But Paloma Rose went a step further. She organized and hosted a training session of hundreds of hairdressers uh, in having climate conversations. It was addressed by a climate scientist describing the physical realities and then by a social scientist giving guidance on good climate conversations. Uh, so that, that's one of the principles that, that we're working on in the Nelson Tasman uh, climate Forum. Can I have the first slide, please? <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm I'm going. Uh, let's just bring that up to to the full screen. Uh, I I'll be describing to you now uh, how how the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum works with that principle. Uh, I do have a goal for today's webinar and my hope is that you'll land in one of three spots. Uh, one would be 
well, we could do that in our region. Um, the second could be, well, we're already doing it, but this gives us a few new ideas. And the third would be, we've got to tell Nelson Tasman Climate Forum about the, the amazing stuff we're doing in our region so they can get onto it too. We need lots more people taking action and lots more people urging strong action by governments. And I do think those two things go together, that when people, uh, for perhaps a variety of reasons, take uh, action in their own lives, or their own, their own households, their own local areas, they identify themselves as the kind of people uh, who want, want to bring about a safer climate and ready to do other things, to go to further lengths. Uh, to make that happen. So how did the forum develop and what do we do? Well, it developed out of a preceding think tank called Zero Carbon Nelson Tasman. Um, and that was a group of nine activists, ma mainly experienced activists, some of, uh, some of whom had, had developed over decades in the peace movement. Uh, and were now applying themselves to the climate movement. And this group, Zero Carbon Nelson Tasman, saw a need to have a much broader front acting on climate change, drawing the two councils of the area, Nelson City Council and Tasman District Council, together and involving the eight iwi of our region, businesses, community organizations, youth, and so on. Uh, we wanted to create a Tiriti supportive organization. And the, uh, the initial uh, driving force behind it, Julie Nevin and others, talked to the two councils and eight iwi, uh, and they received a supportive response. Um, so they developed a charter with three clauses, um, focusing on drawing communities together to do these three purposes. Um, they, the first was involved mitigation of climate change, reducing emissions urgently, increasing sequestration. Um, the second involved adaptation. And the third was um, to do this all in a way that created a just transition uh, for all living organisms, including humans, to an equitable society. So this passed through the councils and the iwi, and it was not a smooth passage. Um, it, they, it went back again and again to get wording that could be accepted by the two councils and the eight iwi. Um, uh, with uh, bumps on the way. And in fact, we're still in the process of getting it translated into Te Reo uh, or uh, actually interpreted into Te Reo. So then there was a big launch with 300 attendees and we were fortunate to get James Renwick and James Shaw um, to, to the launch and we were off. So I'll tell you, uh, I'll describe a little of the structure and governance of the organization. And I think it's the fourth slide that will show that. Thank you. Flip on, on. Oh, oh there's, there's the hairdresser. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so here, here's the, the charter with its three clauses. And I will then go on to the structure of the, um, of the organization. The next slide. The next, ah, good. Okay, so the, the forum has two co-chairs of whom one is from uh, Iwi and one is Tao Iwi. Uh, uh, currently, the iwi chair isn't isn't occupied, um, and and I'm I'm the uh, non Maori chair. Uh, there are four iwi representatives, four council representatives, one from each uh, one councillor and one staff member from each council, and eight other members, at least one of whom should be under twenty five. And currently, we have three dynamic young people 
between 14 and 17, which is rather a joy to us. Uh, we have three part-time paid staff um, and their, their designated coordinator, communications manager, and group and project guide. We have about 100 full signatories who are um, completely involved in all decision making by the forum, which is by consensus. Our email list however, is about a thousand. Um, the, the, um, oh, I should have mentioned that the three part-time positions add up to about 45 hours a week. The funding is largely from the Nelson City Council for which we're hugely grateful. Uh, some help from the Tasman District Council, 20,000 from Raja Foundation and individual donations by members comprises the rest. We meet as a forum monthly, um, mainly online now. Um, we, we have managed to get some, a, a few face-to-face -face hui uh, when, when it has seemed possible. And in those, we try, we try to convey our thanks to the volunteers because there's a core of a couple of score volunteers who are utterly dedicated um, to this work. The, the work is divided into working groups and I'll say a little bit about these working groups with the next slide please. Okay so the, the, um, the first is the transport group, how we move ourselves and our stuff around. Um, this group works quite a lot with submissions uh, at the national level and the local level and contributed substantially to an excellent walking and cycling strategy of the Tasman District Council, focuses strongly on mode shift in transport. Uh, what, we, what we grow and eat, uh, and a focus on urban gardening, food self-reliance and food waste. Um, and in, in fact, there are separate groups that work on growing and another fairly large group that works on waste, which runs a monthly repair cafe to emphasize uh, lowering consumption of material and energy. The energy group also uh, works on that principle, lowering, en lowering energy demand, um, conserving energy, and also local self-sufficiency. The education group has the aim of bringing um, basically curriculum change, curriculum inclusion. It, it really aspires to the vision of having children grow up with a, with a profound love for the earth and an understanding of the damage that we're doing to the earth a knowledge of the solutions and how we can collectively be empowered to act on them. Um, so that, that group is plugging away <laughs> towards that aspiration. Um, the nature and climate group gets their hands in the soil and uh, plants trees and uh, wetlands, as well as works on submissions. Um, society and culture group is working on making our fairly Pākehā uh, climate forum more inclusive, more receptive and attractive um, to, to non-Pākehā uh, non uh, people. Um, a climate action plan group has worked on producing a um, climate action plan for the region and I I think I have that on a next slide, if you can look to that. No, maybe not. Um, we'll get back to this one. Um, science, technology and research makes sure that the work of the forum is science-based and an adaptation group at the moment is focused on infrastructure adaptation. Uh, the, the coast of Nelson, Tasman is highly vulnerable. Um, to sea level rise and is one of those 
uh, coastlines that we have recently understood uh, more seriously is also subsiding several millimeters a year as well as subject to sea level rise. So infrastructure adaptation of our coast is, is a major issue here. Um, we haven't yet done a lot on the other face of adaptation, which is the development of resilient communities. Uh, we also have to have several projects that kind of cross groups. So uh, with the next slide, let me refer to, oh, this is an exciting new group, our social marketing group. Um, I want to tell you in a little bit more detail in a minute what we're doing with social marketing, because I think it's an important new thrust of the forum. Um, the climate conversations beyond the comfort zone is, is an interesting little project uh, where some people are quite deliberately reaching out to have conversations with perhaps unlikely targets. Uh, and it had it's had a it's born an early fruit. Um, the forum now publishes a monthly column in the Top of the South Catholic Church Bulletin based on Pope Francis's Laudato Si uh, on what we should be doing uh, to, to preserve the environment and mitigate climate change. Um, there is a, um, a, a proposition that in, in, working on inequality is climate action uh, for several reasons. Uh, two big reasons are uh, it's the richest, who by far emit the most, and we we need to we need to equalize wealth so we don't have gross uh, emissions by the, the richest one percent or ten percent. And the, the other major proposition is that we are if we are going to do this, we're in for major social transformation. We need social cohesion. Um, we need to stick together, help each other, cooperate, collaborate while we do this. And you can by far best do this in a relatively equal society. Okay, let me tell you a bit more about the social marketing because it's quite exciting with the next slide. This is um, a UK generated social marketing initiative. Um, called Jump. It's the Jump campaign, um, and they, they, their big their big banner is less stuff, more joy. How is that for a positive construction on lowering consumption? I love it. Um, and so they have six big slogans: uh, end clutter, keep keep especially your electronic devices for at least seven years, travel fresh. This is a difficult one for. Tasman, we may have to modify it somewhat because there are few alternatives to cars in Tasman, uh, but basically mode shift. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, eat green, that one's obvious. Holiday local, and the, de the details go on from there. One, one short haul flight every three years, you could, if you must, allow yourself and one long haul every seven years. Next slide, please. Dress retro, three new items of clothing a year. I bought a pair of socks. Hmm? No more than three new items. <laughs> yes, fair enough, no more than uh, three new items of clothing every year. Um, I bought a pair of socks yesterday and wondered if that was two of my three. <laughs> um, change the system. So this is the sixth and last of the slogans. Change the system. Um, at least one life shift to nudge the system. Now that that may be a life shift in your own household, like insulating your house or changing your electricity supplier. Um, but it also includes um, the possibility of becoming uh, an, an activist and joining a group. Did we go through the six? Is there another two? Um, oh, no, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we're in the middle of, 
working through this to see what we need to modify, if anything, and how we can apply it in our environment. But we, we genuinely are trying to change behaviour on a large scale. I think the next slide shows the climate action book, which I would like to show you. Um, we're really pleased to relate to low carbon carpety at the moment, uh, as they see this is relevant to their area and they're adapting it uh, for use in carpety. We have had shifts of thinking along the way, um, starting with, with a, a strong focus on climate, um, which also included um, the importance of sequestration, nature-based solutions. But we have shifted a bit on the way. Um, we had a video presentation, among others, of um, ecological footprint guru Bill Rees talking to the forum about overshoot. That is, that the, the, familiar to this audience, the idea that the size of the human enterprise is too big for the earth and overshooting planetary boundaries and needs to be reduced. That forum talk has since had 18,000 views, obviously not all local. And it, it certainly has impacted the thinking of forum members. Um, we are fairly pleased with what we've accomplished in two and a half years. James Shaw recently spoke of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum as one of the best citizen organizations in the country. And he encouraged all councils to fund such organizations. We have a very good relationship with the, the staff of both councils mutual respect uh, and listening to each other's ideas. Uh, <clears throat> the big themes ahead now, uh, the jump campaign, uh, strengthening our relationship with Tangata Whenua, and right now the local elections, we hope to run Meet the Candidates uh, events, uh, climate focused Meet the Candidates. Um, well, for me, the uh, climate conversations beyond the comfort zone continues to be important, um, at including the possibility of fostering, well, there's been a little beginning, the first few baby steps here, fostering a few conversations about degrowth in the business arena in this area. Um, so that, that I'm happy to present to you as uh, what uh, people in this region uh, are doing together um, in terms of climate action with all actions at all levels by all possible actors in the shortest possible time. Thank you very much. Sorts of initiatives around, around the country would be great and um, I'm wondering if through the article 12 um, from the Paris um, agreement whether there's some leverage to um, get more public participation and so on which we are obliged to do um, yeah and if there's anyone with kind of that in mind it's something I've <coughs> become aware of our I guess yeah that that article I just looked at that article a few days ago, Christine. Mm. Um, I was particularly interested in its support of education for children as well as adults. And, yeah. and I think we need to, to think of both. Um, we're, we're probably a bit more focused on children at, at the moment in terms of where we're going with that. But uh, we're also, we've also been discussing, um, and it appears in the National Adaptation Plan draft to the idea of public information centres. Mm. Mm. Uh, so we're, we're talking about the possibility of that. We've also talked about the possibility of online courses. That Those two things are not near to action at the moment. Um, and it, if you have any ideas about mm. ways to move on that, I, I'd certainly mm. be interested. 
Yeah, um, well, maybe we can have some further correspondence about that. I um, wasn't thinking so much of formal education. I'm just thinking of how to people um, really know some of the stuff like you have in your, um, uh, what's the, you know, the, the little um, blurbs, what's it called, jump, um, that sort of thing. People um, don't necessarily know some of those really key actions um, and, you know, information that's important to be an actor in relation to climate change. So, um, yeah. Um, we hope to have a, a, a really um, major online thrust with mm. the jump campaign. Uh, that's great. Yeah. And, and any funding to support that? Have you? We, 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 we certainly have enough funding to shape the project. And I'm not sure uh, I, I, we will be able to have some more to fund actually doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I think Thank the you. next question is, is Gray. Gray Solomon. Are you there, Gray? Um, a question was about adult education, but you addressed that. So thank you. Okay. There's um, another hand up there from Jane uh, yes. Patia. Yes. Jane, unmute yourself, Jane. In a uh, I'm in Kaupo and um, I just submitted on an annual plan where they didn't mention climate change. So I think there's a big disconnect in our district. Um, they may be doing some things around uh, cycle lanes, for instance, or waste minimization, but <coughs> there just doesn't seem to be any sense that they're carrying the community along into the future. So I guess a practical question would be, can we access some of the questions you're going to be answer, asking your councillors uh, around climate change? Is that possible if we can have contact information? Um, I'm certainly happy to do that in Topo, really put them on the spot. Yes, Jane. Um, I, I think what we, what we could do, we haven't developed those questions yet, but we, we hope to reach out a bit to a lot of people. A lot of Invite questions. And Jane, um, will it work for you if we if we uh, put those suggested questions on on our website? Um, would yeah. that work for you? Yeah, I think that would be fine. Thank you. Uh, or uh, otherwise, mean, feel free to correspond with me. We had some very passionate young people in 2017, and I think they wanted the council to sign a climate change declaration. Quite sure what Pat was talking about a similar thing maybe at a national level, but um, yeah, uh, uh, they said they were going to sign it, but to this day, I don't actually know if the mayor has signed that, <laughs> that small pledge. If the mayor has signed that, 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 if the mayor has signed that. We have an audio problem. Right, everybody is now muted. That's good, the audio problem's stopped. Well, we're exactly on time for eight o'clock. And so now we uh, welcome Robert from Southland, Regional Councillor. Robert, I'm not quite sure where you are, um, but you were there. One there is minute. Robert, welcome, thank you. Hello, Pat. <laughs> Hello, Robert. Can you, can you hear me clearly? Just, uh, it's, you're not very loud. I'll, I'll, I'll lean into the screen then, is that better? That's a little better, thank you. Good. I'm naturally, I'm naturally soft of voice, perhaps, uh, except around the council table, um, at which point I'm like a guinea fowl, and if you know what they sound like. <laughs> Firstly, thank you, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, at this forum, Pat. Um, just glancing around all of the faces that are online, it's quite a high-powered forum uh, audience, it seems to me, and I recognise quite a number of the names not so much the faces, it's been a wee while since I've seen some of those faces and probably no one will recognise me because I live in Southland and, and most New Zealanders don't really know where Southland is. No, I joke. Um, and thank you to Joe for, um, for your opening piece there, Joe. It was very interesting. A lot of uh, talkable, debatable, dialogable points in there. One thing that I really uh, uh, took a shine to was your story of the hairdresser 
and her work in changing the mindset of, of the people that she meets. And to me, that's extremely important function of who you might otherwise consider to be ordinary people. And it's that cross-pollination from unexpected sources that I think is our greatest strength, not so much our organized um, groups that we, that we tie together or, or programs that we follow, but more keeping an eye out for opportunities such as your hairdresser, who's already on track, already self-realized and, and aware of what's needed, but working in their own sphere. And a great deal can be gained by giving people like that some support or a nudge. And um, so my, my role down here in Southland, despite my appearance, um, I've been a regional councillor on a regional council in a, in a region that would be uh, characterised as being very conservative. Um, and yet I don't really class myself as a, a conservative person as such. And so being involved with that council over the last 12 years has been a fascinating ride, to say the least. Um, with the election coming up shortly, I hope and intend to be on the council for at least one more uh, three-year uh, stint because there's work to do. But my, the news I bring to this group is that even though we're at the bottom of the island, the bottom of the country, and in the heart of conservative blue Southland, huge changes have been made, have taken place over the last particularly one, two, three years. I've been astonished by the turnaround, the change of focus, the change of language, the change of story, the attitude, and I'm just talking about the regional council here, not even the wider community. And my wider community uh, is a diverse one. You, some of you may know that my wife Robin and I uh, live in a forest garden, um, and we've been living there for 30 years now, and that, as well as our work in the little town of Riverton, where we have an environment centre, a whole lot of fascinating projects, including the Heritage Apple Project and the Longwood Loop, lots and lots of things, brings us into contact with a really wide uh, cross-section of society, from top to bottom, you could say, or bottom from top, because, because there is no top or bottom. Um, but the changes I see, particularly in governance at the top, if you'd call it the top, have been astonishing. In my first, say, six or seven years um, as a regional councillor, I felt that the task was not doable, particularly bringing in uh, ideas or um, heads up around climate change. In the early years, uh, my uh, suggestions that there was a problem uh, and passing on information about those challenges that I could see and you could see coming down the track towards us were met with largely silence or eye rolling from uh, most of the councillors, uh. most of whom are uh, farmers and uh, living true to the farming way of being conservative, of not jumping on the, on the bandwagon, uh, of um, taking their time to ponder things, but being patient enough to wait that out has led to what's happened in the last, say, three years here um, in Southland and um, on the regional council, around the council chamber, and that is a transformation of their thinking and a, and a huge focus on climate change. Climate change is now front and centre of everything we do in the council. And I, I take note of the question from, I forget who it was just a moment ago about, um, was it Topol and their, one of their councils who appeared not to uh, perhaps be, <laughs> to be acting quite quickly enough. Well, I'm not sure if that is truly the case because if they're anything like our council, they can't get away from it. And a lot of that, um, 
attention drawing come in our particular council comes to, uh, the environment Southland, Southland Regional Council comes not particularly from me, but definitely from the staff. And what happens on, on councils is that councillors like myself become graying and aged and we hold on and we hold on and we, you know it's a problem. It's very hard to bring in uh, young blood into a, into a council and get them round the, round the table. However, that's not true of the staff. Staff turnover amongst um, most councils is very high, particularly at the moment when central government is offering such good returns for planners and ecologists and so on. Councils are finding it difficult to retain those people. And that means that the turnover is very fast. But that also means that younger and younger um, scientists and so on are being brought into the councils with their young ideas. And those young ideas are streets ahead of us old dinosaurs who sit around the council table, particularly when it comes to climate change. And we are finding that we have, we're getting now um, staff members who have um, got PhDs in climate change associated matters and can speak with absolute authority where we may be just um, stitching together what we can from the news media or from, from you know, the usual sources. So that ch change in itself has been profound. Um, awareness and behavior and focus on climate change around our council table, table has accelerated dramatically. Another really um, powerful factor in that change has been the involvement of iwi. And down here in Southland, Murihiku, or throughout the, the whole of the South Island, Te Waipunamu, um, largely it's in Ngaitahu, who are the iwi that we work with. Mana whenua um, of our particular area are the four um, papatipirunaka um, that we deal with, and they're very enlightened and very modern and very progressive, particularly around this issue and where the issue of climate change interrelates or interfaces with water quality. And the work that the council, the regional council has done with water quality has been the in for a greater understanding of climate change because they're so intimately linked. And in our work with um, uh, water quality, improving water quality across uh, Murahiku Southland, we've worked very closely with the Runaka and Mana Whenua and Ngaitahu and their particular kaupapa around Mahinga Kai, the provision of food and resources for all people. And any of you who are involved with regional councils or any council at all will know of the term te mana o te wai and the, and the word haora. And the bringing in of those words and concepts from Taha Māori, from Te Ao Māori, have been transformational. At first, they were confusing for uh, people who, older people particularly, who weren't um, au fait, to use a word from Te Reo Māori, no, who weren't au fait with um, Te Reo Māori and some of the words and expressions that are commonly used by mana whenua. However, the patience that mana whenua have shown um, in helping us to understand what those things mean and what the ramifications are have truly paid off, not only in the understanding of, of the councillors, um, but also um, in law. And you'll know that te mana o te wai as a measure for water quality um, is now um, embedded in law. We have to take more than just regard of it. We have to act um, now with that measure in mind. It's not an optional thing. And that's been a big surprise and a big fright and a huge step forward for um, Pākehā councillors townspeople, farmers, and so on. So having um, uh, Ngaitahu and um, Mana Whenua down here on board with us around the table and sharing these ideas has really moved us forward. And I, I don't know where we stand 
comparable to the rest of the country, but I suspect surprisingly we'll be well up with the play. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, um, a little bit of history about how far we've come. Um, I can remember a long, long time ago here in Riverton, a group of us in our activist, younger activist phase, in the early days of the ideas of doing a protest or some kind of activism around climate change, we devised a protest which was to be held on a local feature, which was a large viewing platform that extended out into, into the estuary that's here. We chose to use umbrellas as our signature and chose a day, a morning, a Saturday morning, where all those invited were to turn up on the platform, stand there with their umbrella up um, and get a photograph for the press, for the, for the media. On the morning, plenty of people turned up, all with their umbrellas, but the weather was so shocking that we almost, well, I, I suggested that we go home, but everybody was keen. We went, to, we strove out onto this viewing platform. The wind, the hail and the rain immediately blew all the umbrellas inside out. So of course it made a fantastic photograph um, <laughs> demonstrating the way we viewed the future in terms of an overcharged atmosphere um, and um, weather and climate that was going to be difficult and out of the ordinary. So from those early days through to now have been a, a profound change. On the council, they were very, very reluctant, um, say five years ago, to, to even talk about climate change and certainly battered it away at every opportunity. I chose, for better or worse, um, to move that we, that we declare a climate emergency. I gave them fair warning. I sent through plenty of information, told them I was going to do it, advertised in the local newspaper, inviting the general public along to join, to be there to witness this historic moment when the council would declare a climate emergency. Um, we filled the council uh, viewing room, which normally has either zero or one or two people along to watch ordinary events with 60 or so people, um, 55 of whom were supportive. Five farmers turned up, um, five climate change denying farmers turned up. And I spent a bit of time with them before the meeting and just making sure that we were friends um, and that we were looking at this idea um, as a group rather than oppositional. It wasn't a successful um, meeting in that it was voted down the idea of a declaring a climate emergency. However, I regard it, regarded it then, although I pretended not to, as a huge victory. Uh, and it was because we got such coverage through the media. Um, the other councillors and their supporters were forced to explain themselves essentially. And many of those explanations um, rang hollow, quite frankly. Uh, and it was obvious to those people in the crowd that that was the case. As a result of losing that particular battle, the council, I suppose, to help ease my pain, and I was <laughs> in no pain, but I, I, I let them feel that I was, created a, um, a, a subcommittee or a committee on climate change, which I felt was a, a SOP, if that's the right word, a, um, you know, a committee when you're not having a committee. And that didn't last for very long, however, what that did do was it allowed the staff to come in and uh, guide us, those people who were on that committee. And then as that kind of faded a little bit, the whole council decided that we would in fact take leadership in the region over climate change. There's a number of count, there's four other count, three other councils in the region, um, territorial authorities, but we took the bold move of putting our hand up and saying, we're going to lead this. We're going to draw you all together. And we're going to, uh, and what that resulted in was a hui, which was held just three days ago here in, um, in Southland. In the Transport Museum, I have to say, a museum of all the old magnificent cars, buses and trucks from yesteryear, I thought it was very ironic that this, what I consider a, a, a historical, and, and um, oh, I don't know how you say it, it was, it was really quite something it was attended by all of the councils, mayors and chairs, 
counselors and staff and iwi and youth and a whole lot of other people from the public invited to speak on issues such as food security, food sovereignty. It was really quite astonishing. And there was huge support in the room. There was no dissent that I could see at all, but the real, I was going to say killer blow, but I try not to use emotive language like that. But the, the really powerful moment I were the four, yeah. first presenters and rightly so, and that was Ngai Tahu. Um, uh, the regional, the councils in Southland have a um, have long had an association with a group called Te Ao Marama, which is a representative group from the four Runaka down here. They have worked with all of the councils for years on lots and lots of issues. They presented first, and they presented, um, I guess, climate change from the point of view of Tiao Māori, and it was fabulous, absolutely fabulous um, to hear their message, which came from that came from an older place than ours, I feel. And they talked about their thousand years of of projected action, rather than say the next four or the next fifty, um, the way others may have thought about. And then went on to describe or to, to alert us to the release very shortly of the Ngai Tahu Climate Change Declaration or, or mm. paper or document or whatever, I forget mm. quite what they were calling it. But to hear that Ngai Tahu were already at the stage, well ahead of us, and that their thinking and their preparation and their explanations and their support was so, uh, so profound and so very much set in place. I don't like to say that we felt embarrassed to find ourselves outflanked by Iwi, but we did. And that was very exciting. And this is something that I think all of the councils are proud about. We are proud that our, <laughs> I was going to say our Iwi, it's not our Iwi at all, but those Iwi that we co-govern with and co-manage the environment with are so proactive. And it's really giving us a shove along. Things down here are very uh, exciting, very promising, and there's a great deal happening. So I could stop there, but I'm not quite sure how long you want me to speak for. Well, um, you, that's a lovely point to end on. Um, I'm wondering if we have questions. We've got 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I can see that um, Rick, you had your hand up, is that right? No? Okay, sometimes it accidentally goes up. Um, I've just flipped through. Um, if somebody has a question ready, um, please speak and say who you are. No questions yet. Maybe that I can therefore just start. I must say, I would very much like to see the Naitahu Climate Change Declaration. Um, I guess that, that a Google search would um, bring that up, uh, uh, un unless you have another way that would, we could access it. Is it a kind of public declaration where- it, it will be, it will be, Pat. I don't know if declaration's quite the right word and they haven't published it yet. So it's, okay. just, it's just about to come. Perhaps if there are no questions, I could just- but, Sorry. Okay, say something then um, Joanna would like a, a question. Okay, um, well, perhaps to, I'll just introduce this idea. One of the very, uh, and I think it might be helpful, it's a model, not exactly of climate change, but of water quality um, yeah. that's just been used here um, in Southland and it's called the Regional Forum. And their work, which has taken three years, is a beautiful example of how to pass down from the top, I suppose, objectives no. and get that down into the community for real action. So I could talk to that, but I'm happy to ask any uh, answer any question. Was it Jack, Jack or Joe? Yeah, hi, thank you. Hi, hi Robert, uh, thanks very much for, for giving us a, um, a reminder that there are many, many ways of uh, approaching this issue, and that each each area, each region, each locality will will find its own way. 
Yeah. And uh, I think that's a really important uh, message. Thank you for reminding us. But uh, a question I have um, in terms of the enthusiasm for climate change, has any of it expanded to the issue of ecological overshoot? You know, if we look at climate change as simply one symptom of an even deeper problem, we'd, I'd be interested in yeah. your comments about that. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Jack, and 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 hello. Um, I should have said hello to you and Joe <laughs> at the beginning. I know the two of you no came worries. down and walked around our garden, our forest garden, yeah. in the early days. So it's lovely to see you. Lovely yeah. spot. <laughs> Ecological overshoot now, very much at the forefront of everything that we're thinking about and doing down here. And there's an interesting, uh, not a conflict, but a, a tension between Maori and Pakeha. I guess you could. You could characterize it that way. Iwi have been saying, Mana Whenua have been saying for a long, long time that we're well overshot, that oh. the, um, the mahinga kai, the access to resources, healthy resources that they enjoyed pre-European has changed profoundly and that they've been alerting to that, us to that forever. Now they're starting to get real traction because we are, be, we are seeing that it is the case and it doesn't just affect mana whenua, it affects everybody. The la, I think the greatest challenge for a whole region to accept that comes from the farming community ah. because they don't see it that way because they regard mahinga kai, they have their view about food production, how that's done, they have their view about ecological wellness and what that looks like, but that doesn't match up with how mm -hmm. environmentalists or ecologists like myself see the picture, and I presume everybody else on this um, at this meeting. Um, so there's there's a conflict of worldviews, and that's all it is, in my view. And the way to its story, it's all about story and changing the story is how it's done and ha the way to change story is through people and people talking and that's why this kind of forum is so good that's why when um uh Kauiwi and tangata whenua come together and talk i was going to say about this this regional forum and, and they've made it was a it was a forum of people who was brought together from the general public tasked with um, traveling around the region for three years, looking at all the issues of water quality and talking to, um, to everybody they could. In that group, there were, there were a number of tangata whenua and they made sure that in their travels, some of their overnight stays or their hui or their conference were held on marae. That combining of people, sending them on a task which involved a lot of talking, resulted in a profound change in everybody concerned, particularly some of the very <laughs> reddest of the necks, some of the very bluest of the blue farmers, who I imagined would never change, but I've discovered on their final night when they presented it to Rauaroha Marae at Bluff, that they were profoundly changed and that they were talking now from their hearts rather than their heads, and that they were now tasked with the unenviable task of going back to their own communities, their own catchments, their own farming rural areas, and passing all this on to their mates. Thank you, Robert. We've got five minutes and we have a question from Adam. Uh, kia ora kato. Um, can you hear me okay? Sure. Yes. Great. Um, fascinating and very useful, thank you, your talk. And I think it harks back to something from the Nelson Climate Change Forum about that idea of reaching beyond our bubble of people who already converted. So really yes. valuable stuff. Yeah. Um, my question was around, and you've, you've partly answered it with the final bit you're talking about and the change of hearts rather than of minds. But with your benefit of hindsight, because it was over quite a long period that you were sort of went from eye rolling to a more sort of embraceive approach amongst the council. Yeah. Um, with hindsight, and I know it's always a delicate thing, but is there anything that you think could have happened earlier or accelerated that change? It's a very good question. And 
I think probably in different parts of the country, things will move at a different pace. Look, one of the things, two things are helping us enormously. One is the central government presently, and, and not, not directly their work on climate change, although I'm a great fan of James Shaw's, um, not directly their climate change work, but I think their work around co-governance and sharing, sharing decision-making with tangata whenua. One of the really interesting things that came up um, during the meeting just three days ago, when we were uh, connected through to the Climate Commission, was this, the idea that around the world, indigenous societies are being called upon or being given space to tell their story. Same story that they've always told, we ju was, just weren't listening. So that, that change, and I think it's a profound and it's a global change, along with the reality of the climate and what's happening, those two things are incredibly powerful. They're working, unfortunately, um, to support our message here. It's a shame we had to say this message at all, but we do. But we're backed like by Papa Tuanuku, by Pachamama, by Mother Nature. We really are. We just have to now act, as we all know, we just have to act. But it, it, from my point of view, it's all on. I'm highly energized by all this, despite my aged appearance. <laughs> Great, thanks to hear. And that, that helps actually as the road in, because that's quite a, a national road in rather than specific to yeah. the region. Thank you. Um, I have had a quick look and I can't see any. Um, There's answers. another another uh, question there from Carlton. Uh, Good. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Carlton. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Hi, yes. thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Robert. My name's Carlton. I'm volunteering with an organization called Lawyers for Climate Action. Ah. Um, I know um, this is really just a, a starter for me. Um, I don't know too much about um, these topics. I'm just on the learning phase. Um, but I do have a question for Robert after saying thank you very much. I found it very interesting listening to you and and hearing some very, very positive reactions from local government, because my research so far has shown that, or has suggested at least, that local government are struggling under the weight of responsibilities. And I'm quite interested to hear what Southland um, Regional Council um, are doing in the way of their relationship with um, central government. And I'm also quite interested to hear what's happening in regard this new uh, amendment to the Resource Management Act, whereby councils are now permitted to take into account greenhouse gas emissions, both in their consenting and also in their regional plans. Um, some of that stuff uh, led me to feel quite depressed and I'm, I'm really pleased to have listened to you to, so, so positively sharing. I think that's absolutely fantastic. So hopefully you can put some positive lines on this <laughs> on this dampener as well. Yeah, um, I don't know if I see those as, as dampeners and I, I take it from your point. Um, sometimes things look worse than they actually are and if they provide an opportunity for uh, a greater dialogue, bringing people in from all, um, all parts of the, of the rohi into the story, but um, in terms of the, uh, were you referring to the RMA change, proposed changes to the RMA? Is that what you meant? Yeah, there's an amendment that's, um, that is, that's been passed, I understand, and, but that's not due to um, yeah. rear its head until the end of the year. And yeah. there was talk by the, by the central government of bringing in the emissions reduction plan, yeah. which they've now done. Yes. Um, and my understanding was that councils and having spoken to the sort of local government New Zealand organisation, they're concerned that there's been very little assistance from central government oh. to help prepare regional councils for, for these changes that are yes. you know, literally yeah, just I, I do know what you're saying and I, I sympathise, I understand the angst uh, and that's the story right across all councils mm. that what's being asked of them, it's the same thing across the farming community. However, I don't see it that way. What's mm. being asked of councils is enormous um, yeah. in terms of more... Um, obligations at the same time that's uh, complicated by the loss of staff that I was describing earlier yep. because yep. they can work from home and get paid more by central government. Yes. So it seems like the situation is worsening. 
But what that's actually doing, and it's a bit like um, William Shakespeare being constrained by writing his genius works in sonnet form. It's almost impossible to write a sonnet, and yet it caused his best works to be written. And I think that's what's happening um, in local governance around New Zealand is the screws are being tightened. It seems as though things are getting worse, but in actual fact, it's forcing creativity, it's forcing sharing, it's forcing councils to take note of the, uh, communities and what communities can offer. And I think it also gives communities the opportunity to, uh, they can see that they maybe, they can assist. And of course, all councils yeah. are made of council laws and all council laws live out um, here in the wider community. I, I so see it as a good thing. One of the, I'll oh, just, just quickly, one of the reasons please, why please, a lot please, of councils please. will be unhappy please, with please. it is because that yeah they're largely um, right wing, and um, the government is left wing. So there'll be there'll be noise, but I see it as a good thing. Thank you. Okay. Roger it, we it, that's a, um, a good point then to invite our last speaker, Yoon from Lower Hutt City. Now um, you're there. I hope Yoon. I can't yes. quite see where you are. I am. If you can hear me, <laughs> I can hear you. I'm sure I'll find your face in a minute. It's, um, uh, it's in amongst the 79. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you for your time. And we're sorry that you're alone. You were going to be sharing time with um, Perry, who was laid low with um, COVID. So we wish her well. And we're very ready to listen to you. Thank you. Hey, I'll just um, share my screen because we have actually prepared a presentation and Perry is actually on the call but um, yeah she is down with COVID so she's uh, feeling, sure. rather, feeling rather rubbish. Um, let me see if that is coming through. You should see a, a blue screen now. Wonderful yes. Yep. Um, now Perry is online so um, Perry if you um, you know if you feel up to it later maybe in the Q&A's you might want to you might be able to uh, jump in. Um, so, so I've been asked to prepare this presentation um, as, a, as a contribution to this webinar today, uh, this workshop, and um, it's it's about our, I guess, our path or our, our uh, work over the last couple of years to develop a lower hut climate action pathway, um, our race against time, and I guess the, um, the title is quite fitting. Um, the Māori title actually translate as, translates as when the tide recedes, the oyster catcher strikes. Uh, I guess it's very fitting, although I guess the tide's going the opposite way at the moment. Um, now, I'm, I'm the head of climate and waste at Hutt City Council, and Perry has just joined the team as the Lower Hutt Climate Action Pathway lead. Now, I've been at council for the last four years, so I've, I've seen, I guess, the right that we were right at the beginning of when we started this work for, for what, laid, what, what later on become the action pathway, uh, but it certainly didn't start out that way. And um, Perry has also been involved. Um, she's, she's been in the Healthy Families team, so she actually took part in some of the collabs and, and workshops as we developed this, um, but it, she's now joined the team. So um, just very briefly on myself, um, I'm the head of climate and waste, so I look after all the uh, uh, the landfill and the curbside services and also the climate work so that's being that that means the the city-wide action pathway and its implementation um, and also the work that we're doing at an organizational level so that's our uh, organizational carbon reduction plan that we also published in, in July in August last year which sets out a range of actions so I'm not going to talk about that today but if anyone's got any questions I'm sure we can um, cover those off. So let's um, just dive into it. Um, so I will cover uh, these sort of four things today, uh, the, a little bit on the why, and, I, and I'm conscious that I'm talking to a converted audience, so I'm not going to labor the point. Um, most of you, I think, will know very well what their challenge is uh, and why we're doing it. Um, but uh, we prepared this presentation for a different context, so we thought we'd just recycle it. Uh, then a little bit about the co-design approach and how we started and, and well, we didn't start with us, and, but how we, I guess, changed tack and then how we uh, approached this piece of work. Uh, a little bit on the engagement of how we went about 
developing it and, and and then just a few words on the co-implementation approach and I guess that's only just getting underway. Uh, the um, the pathway was endorsed by council back in, uh, in, in April this year so it's, it's fresh off the press so to speak. Okay so very little, uh, very quickly on the why. Um, as I said, I don't want to labor the point, so uh, most of you will be familiar with this graph and, and the reason why we're drawing out sea level rise is because that is perhaps the most significant issue for Lower Hutt as a city, um, given it's um, located on a floodplain and um, even at uh, one meter sea level rise, it, it will have quite significant impacts, um, not, not even talking about the, uh, the more significant and um, extreme scenarios that might well play out um, as early as the next um, century. Um, so this is what Lower Hutt could look like uh, in a two meter scenario. Uh, I haven't pictured the one meter one because we're effectively locked into that. Uh, what I have done though is that we've we're showing here the two meter scenario because that's kind of the one that we're still trying to avoid with the work that we're now doing on, on carbon emission reductions both at an organization and at a citywide and of course global and, and national level. Uh, interestingly enough for those that are not uh, familiar with Lower Hutt, uh, I guess you could see the floodplain and you see the river um, you know, meandering its way through the city uh, there is actually the lowest part of the city is actually in, in an area called Alice Town, which is that sort of slightly more orangey bit here. So when people think about sea level rise, they, you know, they usually think about the, 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 um, the beach and, and the houses immediately adjacent to that, but actually in Lower Hutt, the areas that could be more severely affected are actually further back. Uh, with sea level rising, it means that, of course, anything that drains down the hills in terms of stormwater can't then drain upwards. So it needs to go somewhere, and I guess that's where it's going to accumulate. And that picture uh, correlates quite well with um, the work that Wellington Water is doing in terms of its flood modelling. Oh, so I'm just going back the other way. Uh, and um, some of you might have seen this graph before, so this is just a little bit on the Y again. It's like, okay, well, if we'd started seriously addressing this in the in the 90s then we wouldn't be in such a dire situation right now in terms of the quite significant costs to get this down really really quickly and of course the longer it takes the more difficult that pathway will be okay so just a little bit on the uh, lower art emissions profile just to get give you guys a little bit of context for those that are not from from the city um this is the information from our regional carbon footprint so that's something that all the councils have collaborated on and and so the most recent data we have is for 2018-19 and there'll be a repeat of this probably next year um, we're not doing it every year because of the cost but um, given that you know unless you change something significantly it's not going to look very different uh, so the key i guess the key message here is that as a city it's probably quite consistent with others that the key challenges around transportation uh, and stationary energy being um, you know, heating homes and businesses, heating and powering. And then there's a little bit on waste industry and, and a very small part on agriculture, which is effectively, I think, largely Belmont Park, which will move into, um, uh, will be reforested over the next few years um, based on Greater Wellington's plans. So there has been a bit of a change in terms of emissions over the last few years, but, uh, and it's largely due to shutting down one of the landfills that have, didn't have any gas collection um, but by and large you know we, we're still a it's a massive effort to get this down to what, what it needs to be okay so in terms of the co-design approach when council first made a commitment uh, when first when council first made a commitment to um, develop a carbon reduction plan which was actually as far back as 2017 uh, and that was before I joined council. So there, there wasn't, I don't think there was any real resources put into that area to actually make that happen, uh, which is something that changed in 2018, just when I joined and uh, the council, I guess, set up a dedicated team to look into that. Uh, what are we doing about sustainability and climate change? 
And um, we, we started work on, you know, the carbon footprint and, you know, understanding what the challenge would be. And then obviously some work around developing a plan. And initially, at least, probably in line with most, with a lot of other councils, the plan was, okay, well, let's develop a plan and then consult with the community and then ta-da, here's your plan. But that doesn't mean that anyone in the city gives the hoots about what the council has come up with. And I guess in um, 2019, um, I came across the Taranaki 2050 work, which was basically a roadmap facilitated by Creative HQ, which came about in the context of them uh, not, uh, not handing out these new gas permits. So it was all about sort of shifting the Taranaki region. So in that, when we first then started talking to Creative HQ, we thought, well, maybe there's something in here to do a slightly different approach and and rather than you know officers coming up with a plan and then consulting with the community could we actually involve the community in the design of that work and not not in fact not just the design of the plan or the pathway but designing the engagement process so that i guess we we put this on a more uh solid footing now it doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of the process, we have a lot more buy-in than we would otherwise have. That, that's yet to be proven. Um, you know, that's we're going to see that in the implementation phase. But I guess in theory, there's the the, the there should be a higher the, the possibility should be there to improve the buy-in we get from various sectors of of stakeholders and mana whenua, uh, from various stakeholders. So. So that's the, uh, that was kind of the thesis. That's how we started up. Um, so once we actually got underway, which wasn't until about 2020, and of course uh, the, the minor thing of a pandemic sort of reared its ugly head as well in trying to get this off the ground. It took actually nearly a year to, to, get, um, to get this lead group established that we would that would effectively lead the design of the engagement and then um, help us develop the, the, the pathway. Um, and uh, we we partnered with the we partnered with Teatiawa with that, so they were uh, involved in in the lead group. Um, TK, one of the lead group members, uh, was their representative. And uh, I'll talk about it in a minute about the the lead group and who was on it. But the establishment of that lead group took, took quite a while. In phase two, we then looked at the actual co-design of the, the actual engagement. So how would we actually reach all the communities out there in the business sectors? Um, because it's easy to say, well, why don't you just, you know, get input from the business community? Well, I was like, well, how do we know? Who, how, how would we actually talk to them? How do we reach them? Who, who's actually got connections to them? Um, so that phase was really about getting a better understanding of who's out there and how do we how do we reach them. And I guess the lead group members would be quite crucial in that because they have their connections, their relationships, and and their relationships again have relationships with other people that we want to um, tap into. In phase three, we we effectively did some targeted engagement with various uh, community groups and also the business sector. So, for example, we had. Um, that were mainly the form in the form of workshops and and one of the good examples of that was that um a youth workshop uh where we had really good attendance and, and they mapped out basically the things that were important to them and and what's important to them and what they felt like needed to be done ultimately was quite important in the next two fa in, in phase four which is really the co-design of that of that what ultimately would become the pathway and that involved a number of um, collabs and what, what they called alignment um, hui and and by alignment hui it was actually about bringing together the various parties including central government and actually working out well what actually what is happening because a lot of people think oh you know nothing's happening council isn't doing stuff but actually council is only one player in this you know looking at wellington you've got Greater Wellington Regional Council and Metlink. So they're electrifying their, their bus fleet. Okay, well, that's something that we need to know that needs to be in, in the in the in the pathway. And there are a lot of things that central government is doing, and there's a lot of things that the community is doing. So those alignment ways were really they were really about understanding what's actually going on. So we can then build a pathway that's 
incorporate incorporates the stuff that's already happening and then in phase five which is kind of like what we're in now which is we're getting up you know we're getting into the implementation phase and, and i guess that's where perry will be very crucial in helping us um do that work now just very briefly on the um, lead group so here's just a few pictures and um was made up of 11 um community leaders including uh, mana whenua with tk um there on the uh, on the far right um, we had James Renwick from um, the Climate Commission and Victoria University in there. We had someone, Jude from the uh, immigrant, you know, like a representative of kind of reflecting the immigrant community views. We had um, Josh as the, um, Josh Briggs as our, the chair of the uh, community, uh, climate, and com uh, sustainability com climate and Sustainability Committee at Council. Uh, Virginia Horrocks, who some of you will know, um, shout out to Virginia if you think you're online. Can't see you along, um, amongst all those 79 people. Uh, we had Helen from the uh, Business Chamber of Commerce. We had Sorsha who was heavily involved in the, um, in the youth um, school strike for action movement uh, a couple of years ago. And um, Karen Young, um, Zero Carbon Hut, um, like a community organization and uh and my boss helen is the she's the director of environment and sustainability at um at uh, hud city council and ken laban in terms of the the pacifica community so i guess what we tried to do with the lead group was get a re get a get a good representation of the of the wider community and 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 tap into their networks which would later be really important to actually to identify the people that actually would come to the alignment hui and the collabs and the you know design workshops for the pathway. Um, now during the engagement, um, we we learned quite a lot of things and and all that information is is available online under the Have Your Say Hut City I think and then Community Climate Change Response. So all those logs of the various workshops are available and, and if anyone wants to dive into them you know fill your boots um so as i mentioned earlier there were there were various hui and, and and workshops with environmental groups um location specific ones like the ones of the tony um and koro koro and stokes valley and also you know with particular stakeholders or um, sections of the community like the youth workshop for example um, now, some of the learnings, I guess, from that process is that um, co-design does take longer. Uh, and I, I'm on record of saying to councillors and some of the lead group members, is like, well, because they, you know th there was frustration among the uh, uh, along the way that you know why is this taking so long? But the reality is. I could write you a plan in, in a couple of weeks. The reality is no one will buy into it. So we need to go through this process together to actually get that buy-in. Um, so, you know, alone we're faster, but together we go further. So co-design takes longer and, and, and it certainly isn't um, cheap uh, because all this facilitation of workshops and, and creative design that needs to happen to make it effective all, all that costs money so there's there's certainly and i've said that to other councils if you want to consider going into that and you know go go into this with your eyes wide open um don't expect it to run like a rigid project because you don't actually know what you're going to design until you write in it um it does rely heavily on great facilitators and strong relationships so so uh, creative hq you know um, heads off to them. They, they did a really good job at facilitating workshops and, and getting information out of the participants. Um, I already talked about rigid project management. Um, we, you know, you have to be really flexible and that can be daunting for councillors, uh, councils in general, because, you know, usually, you, you know, you're, you're quite rigid in your project management approach with, with this stuff, you kind of have to build the plane while you're flying it. Um, and collaboration and getting together, you know, ended up being a key outcome. So, so we actually discovered quite a number of projects 
um, both in terms of government departments or what, what's happening in the community that we didn't know about. And it, that, you know, these alignment tool here that I mentioned earlier really played a key role in this to uncover this. Now the pathway is uh, quite a fitting photo with the, you know, the sailing boat, um, well, the, the walker going, going forward. And um, this is our pathway. I'm not going to show you the whole document. You can read this in your own time. But this is basically the A3 that summarizes it on a page. Um, and as you can see, it has it, it, it stretches across all sectors, uh, be it transport, energy, waste, consumption, um, uh, you know, the future city design, and also you know a little bit not not heavily on it, but there's a little bit on there around climate adaptation as well. Um, just very briefly, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because um, I was really hoping Perry would cover this, but um, in the pathway document, we obviously identified a lot of things that are going on and things that will be happening, but we also identified sort of six or seven projects that, that the community identified as something that they really wanted to see, but they don't have a natural owner. So it's not like you can point to an agency and say, well, you're doing it. Um, so those are there are six projects, um, Live Well Locally is an example, is sort of, you know, looking at the 20 minute neighborhood um, that we'll be, we will be working on um, over the next little while and Perry will be um, crucial in helping us um, make progress on these. Um, this was just, uh, this is a slide on, on that particular um, example and it's, and as I said, there's no natural agency for like, what if you want to imagine a neighborhood that's totally different and how would you, how would you actually implement it? How would you make it happen? And there's clearly, you need a lot of players on this. It's not just one agency's task. And, and so this is where uh, my colleague Perry will come in in terms of building those connections and, and pulling the strings together to, um, to realize some of these, um, these outcomes that we, that we want to see. Um, is it possible? Uh, oh, say, I think so, um, because this is actually a picture of um, Perry kindly uh, dug this out. Um, apparently, it's, it was available in the archives in Noah Hutt. So this is, I think, in the 1950s, mm -hmm. 1955, Riddiford Baths in Lower Hutt. So, um, y you know, th that was the situation then. So it doesn't mean that we, it will look exactly like that again, but uh, it certainly and it, it shows you the sort of things that can be there if if you put your mind to it. Um, and certainly when you look at an example like Amsterdam, which was quite car dominated until the 70s, and um, you can actually change. Um, it's not going to happen overnight necessarily, but it can actually happen reasonably quickly and certainly within a lifetime. So um, those are just a couple of examples in terms of, you know, how transport systems can change. But equally, if you look at, you know, a trusty uh, mobile phone, and, and some of you guys will be old enough to remember the bricks. Um, I certainly remember it. Um, there's been a lot of change in a very short amount of time. So uh, change can happen. And I'm um, pretty confident that with this pathway, even though it doesn't give you all the answers, it certainly sets a direction and uh, with, you know, enough effort and attention on it, I'm pretty sure we can, we can make the transition that needs to happen. So looking forward, uh, Perry will be crucial in helping us co-implement this, this pathway. And it's really about, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's about building relationships, um, keeping them alive and, and making the connections in terms of what's happening and how we can build on what's already out there. Uh, so it's building the movement, focusing on the opportunity and, and showing leadership. And um, just to close on that, I guess that's also one of the reasons why Hutt City Council, we have put a lot of effort in terms of bringing our own house in order because it's easy to say, well, you must do stuff without actually doing it yourself. So, so hence why uh, over the last three years, we, we've made quite a big um in my view, quite big steps in terms of electrifying our fleet. Uh, it's now 42% electric, up from 2% only two and a half years ago. 
um, getting out of gas. We've got the funding committed to make that happen for all the facilities and all the pools by 2030. And a couple of them have already been realized and, and, um, and decarbonizing our, our services. Like for example, our curbside collection is now 50% electric and will be fully electric by 2024. So I'm just saying that, you know, if you put your mind to it, actually you can make it happen. So I'll leave you guys with that. And um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them and, and Perry might be able to jump in and um, without showing her face uh, if um, she's uh, COVID impacted. Right, thank you. Well, that was quite inspiring and a very comprehensive. Now, um, we've got just a few minutes left and I will clip, flip through um, looking for a hand up. Uh, can you see some Jack? Any hands up? There must be some questions. No, you've left everybody satisfied. And I, see a couple of, I see a couple there from Paul Bruce. Uh, uh, up and then, then Mark Jean. Yeah, Mark Jean. Good. Okay, Paul? Oh, thank you, Jan. Jordan, um, that was really good. I just wondered whether you thought of um, using a carpool in conjunction with other businesses or local government. Um, and then using um, also, you, you, the idea is if you have one electric carpool, you can use cars much more efficiently, but you also could lease, lease it out to, to um, shift workers and other people who can't afford a, an electric car. What do you think about that? Uh, if you're referring to car sharing as opposed to carpooling because they're two different things um then yeah. yes those they are actually, that's actually one of the initiatives in the in the pathway and that's something we're working on uh with Mevo in particular to bring them to lower hut it was um the carpool with your own with the lower hut city council itself you need so many cars but if you share it with other agencies it's a much more efficient way of doing things uh yes and that's something that um we haven't this is a pathway we haven't under haven't gone down and i'm very familiar with that concept because i was heavily involved in the christchurch city council um car share initiative that basically you know it's a it's a city-wide system and and they use it for their own carpool needs but it's available to others um one thing that we're lacking in lower heart a little bit is the scale uh our fleet is reasonably small compared to the likes of christchurch city um, so we're doing, we're going in about it, and we're going about it in a slightly different way, but the outcome will be quite similar, I think. Okay, and we have a, a question from Margie Jean. Huh? Uh, kia ora. I love the way that you have described the extent to which you're trying to align with existing community-led initiatives, and I'm interested in particular uh, because I know that there's been a lot of food resilience workshop work done in, in the hut. Um, from groups like Common Unity and Corky and Kirimai, and you know, there's quite a network building around that. So I'm just interested to see how you're actually adding value or support or you know, leveraging off that alignment around the food resilience sort of side of things. Oh, this might be a question for Perry, actually. Perry, do you want to, are you online? Too hard, but I'm, easy, but I'm just interested in that intersection. I, I yeah, think that Perry. I'll jump on um, without my video on. As you can hear, I'm a bit croaky. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the key there is um, working with those existing um, networks. And we we will have quite a close relationship with um, the Emergency Kai Collective um, and their um, work that they're moving now into more looking at the um, local regenerative food system. Um, the benefit, I guess, is that council was involved in that um, in that process, so um, we can connect through that. And we're also wondering how we um, connect up, you know, this the, the the steering group with the the group that's going to be um, leading the work for them as well. So, absolutely, I think we that that's a very good point, and, and we are very lucky in Lower Heart to have that amazing um, amazing work being done by. Kokiri Marae and, um, and by um, places like um, Common Unity as well. Thank you. We've got just a couple of minutes. Maybe, Jack, can we go a little bit over and have a question? Well, uh, from Tewaki has uh, a hand yes. up there. Tewaki, that's right. Uh, yes. And, 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 Robert. and then Robert. 
and Deidre. <laughs> um, tēnā koutou, katoa. Uh, kia ora, I'm just curious, uh, in Porirua, there's going to be a launch of um, a tatiriti-based climate assembly, and wondering if the Hutt Council have any eyes or anything involved in that. I have some yeah I have I have some visibility over this uh, in the sense that we've met with a couple of um, the people involved in that but it's not it's not a not a direct involvement now but we have we have talked to them about what they're doing and I guess there is some there's some alignment in terms of you know the outcomes that we that we want even though it's a slightly different approach yeah yeah okay so that's part one um and then okay so if you have an idea of what it is are there is there space for that kind of thing to happen in the hut as well? Or is there talk about trying to set something like that up or anything like that? I haven't, I'm not aware of any anything like it in the hut. Um, but if, the, I mean, in terms of the question of if there's there space, well, it, it really is up to whoever wants to drive it. So, um, because this is the sort of thing that, that I don't think should be driven by a council as such, it, it might well have involvement by them, but it needs to be driven by, you know, key champions. Um, so, so is there room for this? Well, possibly. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Robert, you had a hand up. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just very quickly, um, the, the last two questions, uh, the last two questions interest me greatly. And the first one around food sovereignty and food security. Um, down here at, at our regional um, hui that we just held, the Kohukai group down here who represent, I suppose, food security, they got up and said food is central to every decision we make around preparation for mm -hmm. um, the effect of climate change. Food is at the heart of everything. And that was mirrored by Iwi and their, you know, their management of what happens when you go on marae. It's really yeah. a good focus, your belly food and that and that spreads out into into okay. mahinga kai and the management of all of your resources so I, I fully support that is the place to aim to get um the biggest effect and the second thing was uh, uh following to his question about the tariti or waitangi and its role in all of this from if that's what you meant my feeling is that is the greatest leverage that um iwi has in forcing or encouraging uh, councils and governments to do anything. It is also the point where um, people who don't understand what um, treaty obligations are, that's their turning point when they see through exposure to uh, korero about te treaty, that's where it happens. So both of those things, food and treaty are so central to what we're trying to do, or what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, have just, I oh, and just, a, just a response to that, I think um, th there's, a, there's quite a few different pieces of work that are going in, in, around the same time, and one of them is Timahere Tupu, which is our um, urban growth planning, and a, and a lot of that will look at um, urban urban kai and um, and also how we can how we can improve the um, the kai sovereign kai sovereignty um, for for Maori and, and also obviously that, that links to to land sovereignty and and what perhaps what council's role in that is so um, yeah it's a, it's a fantastic question to hear and, um, and 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 nice comments there um, to follow up but um, yeah we've, 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 we we have a long way to go. But all of those things are, are absolutely um, what we need to what we need to aim for. Um, Jack, how are we off the time? I think that um, there might be one more question, or do we need to close? Jack, please unmute yourself. Jack, he's gone. Well, uh, Deirdre, sorry, I, just a uh, quick one. Go ahead, Deirdre. Go. Okay. Uh, just, just a quick question. Yon, um, although waste is a small part, uh, collecting food scraps seems to be a bit of an obstacle for councillors, council um, finances all around the country. Would you comment on that? I was on a waste committee in Kapiti Council some while ago, and it's been a major, you know, problem for us. Uh, well, I can't necessarily comment on. Kabuki Council in particular, but I can certainly for Hutt City Council, uh, we've just started a project together with Porirua 
to develop a develop options in a business case for um, improved food waste management, collection, processing, uh, looking at a more regional um, from a, leg a regional lens, so taking a regional approach to this where possible. Obviously, it's a coalition of the willing. So, um, uh, I guess Kapiti has a few extra challenges in that they don't actually operate any curbside collection anymore. So, so <laughs> tagging on or introducing a new service like food waste collection is going to be a little bit more challenging. But I guess in the hut, um, we've just rolled out a new service, um, recycling and rubbish and um, and opt-in green waste. So, so this the next phase of this was always going to be looking at food waste, and that's what that's the work we're now getting underway. But it's still um, I just need to manage expectations here. It's going to take about a year for for that to be completed, for that work. So it's just getting underway now. The consultants have been appointed. The, 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 the business case will be completed by about May or so next year. And the, the timing of that is intentional because that then goes into the long-term plan process. And for anyone familiar with uh, long-term plan processes in council, if it's not on a long-term plan, it ain't happening. Uh, so therefore it needs to feed into that and so the earliest time we could actually roll out such a new service would be from about 1st July 2025 so it would be a long-term plan in place by 2024 and then having you know basically a, le a year to do the procurement and the roll out the service so 25 is kind of the, the earliest that that would happen. Thank you, thank you very much that is a good way to finish thinking of the um, the long term. The long term is sometimes too terrible to think about, isn't it, when we think about really long term. But we need to have these achievements on the way. Um, I'll leave you with a, maybe it's a rather gloomy thought that I was reading somewhere, that the difference between two degrees, and we know that we're already up to two degrees, but the difference between two degrees and four degrees is actually human civilization. So we're all working to that um, and feeling very much buoyed by the conversations this evening and the pathways that have been struck. Thank you, um, Jack, you can turn us off now. Bye-bye okay. all. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you. Keep well. Can we look at the uh, chat? Oops. Hmm.